In a direct contradiction of the beliefs of creationists, Francis said that when we read about creation in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, we run the risk of imagining God was a magician with a magic wand able to do everything, but that is not so. And he hardly condoned the Big Bang theory that today is considered to be the origin of the universe. The Big Bang does not contradict the creative intervention of God, the Pope said. On the contrary, it requires it. There are those who believe the Catholic Church is faced with the most turbulent time in its history since Henry VIII decided to split from the faith and create the Church of England. And bishops around the world are struggling to get a handle on where this pope is taking them. And it has already been proven they will not go quietly into the light of radical change. Welcome back to Midpoint. The senior editor of The Catholic Thing, noted author of several books, including the very popular The Complete Gentleman, The Modern Man's Guide to Chivalry, Brad Miner joins us on the show. Brad, thank you so much for being here. Pleasure to be back. Brad, when we look at what's happening in the Catholic Church right now, this is interesting indeed. The Pope reassigned a conservative American cardinal from a key post to one that is mostly symbolic. And this is the bishop who came out with a tweet, if you will, thanks to BuzzFeed. The Pope is not free to change the Church's teaching with regard to the immorality of homosexual acts or the insolubility of marriage or any other doctrine of the faith. I cannot remember in recent times when bishops were so blatantly in the face of a pope right now. This almost strikes a fear to them that things are not going to be the same anymore under this guy. And I get the feeling that a lot of bishops wish, quite, wish, quite frankly, the pope would shut up. <laughs> well, I, um, you may be right. There may be bishops who, who feel that way. You know, they're all meeting, the American bishops in Washington, I'm sorry, in Baltimore right now. I mean, as we speak, they're getting together, and I'm sure that there'll be, to some extent, a kind of uh, take a deep breath and think about what happened in Rome uh, back in uh, October when the extraordinary Synod on the Families met, and mu much of what you're talking about, especially the comments you were quoting by uh, Cardinal Raymond Burke, um, who is a very important figure to traditional Catholics and who has recently been moved out of two very important Vatican slots and put into what you'd have to say is a less important position. Um, but the bishops who are meeting in Baltimore are not going to be rehashing all of this. And I think what Cardinal Burke said about what the Pope can do is, is correct. He can't change church teaching. Or rather, I and, and I think it's the case that he does not want to change church teaching. What he wants to do is change some of the ways in which that teaching is applied, what we call pastoral discipline. That's what's likely a year from now when we have another one of these meetings in Rome is likely to happen. But why is there such a pushback? Because you'll have to admit that as this happens, when the Pope says things and bishops say things like what Cardinal Burke said right here, to many people it comes off as still hating homosexuality, being completely against divorce, being a very hardcore Catholic faith again, saying our way or the highway with no changes whatsoever. It doesn't make the Catholic look doesn't make the Catholics look good at all. Well, I don't know that that's true. If, if that's your judgment, fine. I think it, what it does make Catholics seem to be is disunified. And, and to some extent, that's true. But there's a difference between Pope Francis and, say, Benedict XVI or John Paul II. Neither of those two popes had the same tendency that this pope does to speak very much off the cuff, to, to go off the prepared remarks that have been uh, carefully gone over perhaps by his staff before he makes a speech or before he makes a public appearance. He likes to say what he feels and there's no doubt he likes to stir things up. But isn't that Going a good thing, Brad, in many ways? Isn't that really what the Catholic Church needs at this time? Well, but it, it um, I'm not sure what the Church needs at this time. I think it needs to believe what the Church has always believed. And part of the problem is, and I think this Pope will face this, particularly when we get to the next synod uh, next October, is most Catholics, whether they're Italian Catholics or Vietnamese Catholics or American Catholics, have long since forgotten or never learned in the first place what the church teaches. And what we cannot do is change church teaching to suit the mood of the time. Let me bring back to Baltimore, and this is the meeting that you talked about with the bishops gathering here. Michael Sean Winters is a columnist for the National Catholic Reporter. He called this meeting sleep-inducing. 
because apparently what's going to be on the agenda is whether people with celiac disease should be served gluten-free hosts of communion and whether to approve an English language translation of a book of prayers to be used in exorcisms. Shouldn't the bishops be getting a little bit more serious here and taking care of some of the things that are facing 21st century Catholicism? Well, they're, they're going to be doing a bit more than what uh, Mr. Winters mentioned. They're going to be talking about the church's liturgy, what happens in the mass, which is the central event in Catholic life. But again, we had recently a very controversial synod in Rome. Why would it make sense for the bishops to now stir all that up again, have more debates, which apparently, as happened in Rome, became at sometimes some points kind of lacking in civility. Um, that's not what the bishops are supposed to do at this meeting. This meeting is long planned. It doesn't have anything to do with what all these controversies that are stirring up right now that have to some extent to, to do with the Pope's personality. I think that's what some people want though, Brad, a short time that we have. I think that's what a lot of people want. They want to keep the conversation going and they see when the bishops don't discuss this or when one bishop comes out and slams away at the Pope, they see this as what you talked about, a complete disconnect. Well, of course, the, 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 the church is different. The church is a great ocean lining, a, a great ocean liner, is this great ship moving through the seas of life. It takes a long time for it to turn. We're going to have another synod in October, as I say, and the mm -hmm. World Meeting of Families in Philadelphia, to which apparently the Pope is going to come. And that happens in September of 2015, the, the synod in October. These issues are going to be talked about further. And let's, you know, I don't think Mr. Winters nor I know really what the full agenda or the, the full range of comments that are going to be made by, by bishops. One thing I do know is that unlike the Synod, this meeting is going to be wide open. That is to say, there'll be reporters there at every session. It's going to be live streamed on the Internet. So there will be the kind of openness that to some extent the Pope promised going in. Uh, to his papacy that didn't happen at the Synod in Rome, but we will come to conclusions about what the church should be teaching, whether it's a change in pastoral discipline or, which I think is unlikely, a change in doctrine. And there we are, a conclusion at the moment. We're all out of time. Brad Miner, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks so much for your time. Pleasure. All right, breaking back, we turn to the six challenges now facing America in light of the midterm election results. It's coming up right here on Midpoint. <laughs>